I'd like to welcome everyone to worship this morning. Um, please check your events on, on your bullet on the back of your bulletin, but I just want to highlight that Welka is on one, at 1.30 one on Thursday, and we will be starting the new Bible study on growing older and wiser. Anyone that's interested, please feel welcome to attend. Um, and then on a more somber note, Dorothy Hansen called me last night and let me know that Mylan, who is her brother-in-law, collapsed and was taken to the hospital in Kansas City. And that she has requested our prayers because the doctors have done numerous tests and can't find out what caused it. But he is improving some um, because he is now able to speak. And then on another note, her husband LaRue fell and broke his scapula. And so we uh, would like you to pray for him also because he's in a lot of pain because there's nothing they can do for it because that's that inside bone in your, sh in your shoulder. And then next Sunday morning, we have breakfast at 8 a.m. It's a stewardship breakfast, and all are welcome to attend. Um, the 24th is a meet and meet at Sandy at Parsonage for anyone that's interested in attending. There's a sign-up sheet on the table in the narthex. Also, I have put addresses for LaRue and Milan on the lower right-hand corner of the bulletin board in the narthex. Anyone else have anything they'd like to have us know? Welcome to worship. We started, um, but we're working through uh, a very interesting uh, study, and we'd like like for you to join if you if you're interested in it. That's this Tuesday. We'll meet again. Okay. And one other thing uh, to notice too is that uh, for any of those that are involved in confirmation, that will continue this Wednesday as well. We gather in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And our opening hymn is number 403.
Numbers 1 and 2. Holy is the Lord, the Almighty. He is worthy of glory and honor and power. He created all things by his will and came to be. Worthy is Christ the Lamb who was slain. By the blood he purchased for God. The people of every race and time, of every folk and nation. Christ made of them a kingdom. And priests to serve our God. And they shall reign on earth forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. You feed the hungry and clothe the naked. We bless you with your name forever. You set free those who are bound. We bless you and praise your name forever. You raise up those who cur whose courage falters. We bless you and praise your name forever. You provide for our every need. Accept our faithful praises. And you call us from all peoples. We rejoice and bless your name forever. You bless your people with peace. We bless you and praise your loving grace. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. For in your wisdom you have upon us. Let us stand together now and confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ, living together in trust and hope. We confess our faith, saying, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered and died, was crucified and died.
steps. October is Victor Appreciation Month, and during this month we were going to be collecting wow. non-perishable items for the Gainesville Contact Center yeah. in your honor. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. So, thank you'll you. You'll have to check in the entry and, <gasps> and, and see how it grows throughout the month. Wonderful, wonderful. That's fantastic. Thank you, everybody. You couldn't have given me a better gift. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Oh, and more cards. And more cards, too. Thank you, congregation. Thank you, everybody. This is wonderful. That's a real treasure there. And we're going to be talking about treasure today. I'm going to put these right over here. Wow, I can hardly wait to read these. Super duper. Okay, gang. So what have you got for me in the bag today? Look, I see a big smile on his face over here. Something spooky or weird, maybe? Mm -hmm. Oh, look, he's smiling too. It's a, it's a book. The Sea Monsters, it says, by Rick Reardon. The sea monsters. Wow. There's something else in the back. Book one was The Lightning Thief. Have you read these books? They're really good? Yeah? Have any of the other read these at all? Okay, but so they're like there's several books that in a series, right? Okay. The sea monsters. <laughs> you know, the Bible talks about sea monsters. Did you know that? Yeah, how about, have you ever heard of sea monsters in the Bible? No? Okay. You're going to find that there are sea monsters in the Bible, in places like the Psalms. And there are other places where they're mentioned. In fact, sometimes it's translated, the word that they, that they use in the Hebrew language is sometimes translated sea creatures, large sea creatures, or sea serpents. Sometimes they use a word that they just translate right out of the Hebrew, Leviathan. You ever heard that word Leviathan before? Anybody ever heard that? Okay. Leviathan is a word that refers to a sea kind of monsters, monsters of the deep. And they were aware of those things in those days because people sailed out of the ocean. Now the people of Israel didn't do much of that. Well, some of them did. But their neighbors, the Phoenicians, who lived just to the north of them, were great sailors. They sailed all over the Mediterranean. Some people think they sailed up to England and around Africa. That's a long way to go. And they saw weird things in the ocean. In fact, there are some weird things in the ocean there now we don't even know about. Did you know that? Some scientists say we know more about the moon than we do about the own, our own deep oceans. There's stuff down there we have yet to discover. And part of it is because it's hard to get down there. Why is it hard to get down to the bottom of the deepest part of the ocean? Anybody know? Yeah, why? What's that? Yeah, it's very deep. And what, what happens when you get into deep water? Pressure. Exactly right. In fact, just not very long ago, there was a submarine that went down too deep and it was crushed by the pressure of the water and everybody, everybody died. So it's really hard to explore that deep section. They've got, they send robots down there sometimes, robot subs that could do that. But there's stuff in the oceans we don't know about. And God is an amazing creator who created all of that stuff. And what it should do for us is it should make us go, wow, God, you are so awesome. And I think I might have told you, just a week or so ago, I was up in Custer State Park, up there around the Black Hills. I was also in the Badlands. We saw all kinds of animals. We saw buffalo, we saw pronghorn antelope, we saw two different kinds of deer, all kinds of birds, bighorn sheep, and weird rock formations everywhere. And it just made me go, wow, God, you're so awesome. That's what we should do when we look at creation. We should see how God, awesome God is.
But there's something else that we need to know about reality, the creation we live in. And it's not just that God is awesome and good, but that he's loving. And the second thing we need to know about ourselves is where we stand before God. Well, we're going to talk about that today in the scripture. And one of the things we're going to talk about is the pearl of great price or the treasure that was hidden in the field. I'm going to mention those today. We're not actually going to read that scripture. But I brought something that looks like a treasure chest. It is, in fact, my own treasure chest. What would you do if you found this? A treasure chest and you knew it was filled with gold and diamonds and you found it in a field someplace. Nobody knew about it but you. Well, you probably shouldn't because it was in somebody else's field, right? But you might go to that person and say, would you sell me that little piece of land in there? What do you think about that? Well, land costs a lot of money around here. But you looked at the treasure and you thought, that treasure is worth way more than that piece of land. I think I'm going to buy that piece of property. Then the treasure will be mine. Jesus talks about that. You might even sell everything you had just to buy that piece of land so you can have this incredible treasure. And we're going to talk about that today. Meanwhile, thank you for helping me. I'm going to give this back, this bag back to somebody who wants it. Who's going to, who's going to take the bag from me this time? Anybody? Who volunteers to fill the bag next time? Are you going to fill it again, or you? Or you? Not you? You want to fill it with something? Okay. All right, we'll give it to you. And if you want anything out of here, please. It's just a bubbles or some candy. Yeah. <coughs> mm -hmm. Our first lesson today comes from Amos chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, and 10 through 15. Seek the Lord and live, or he will sweep through the tribes of Joseph like a fire. He will devour them, and Bethel will have no one to quench it. There are those who turn justice into bitterness and catch, cast righteousness to the ground. There are those who hate the one who upholds justice in court and detests the one who tells the truth. You levy a, a straw attack on the poor and impose a tax on their grain. Therefore, you have built stone mansions. You will not live in them, though you have planted lush, lush vineyards. You will not drink their wine. For I know how many of your offenses and how great your sins. There are those who press the innocent and take bribes and deprive the poor of justice in the courts. Therefore the prudent keep quiet in such times, for the times are evil. Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you, just as you say he is. Hate evil, love good, maintain justice in the courts. Perhaps the Lord God Almighty will have mercy on remnant of Joseph. Our psalm today is 
Psalm 90, verses 12 through 17, on page 258 in the Green Hymnal. And we'll read it responsibly by verse. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Satisfy us by your loving kindness in the morning, so that we rejoice and be glad all the days of our lives. Make us glad by the measure of the day that you have given us, and in the years in which we suffer in adversity. Show your servants your works and your splendor to our children. Make the richness of the Lord our God be upon us. Prosper the work of our hands. Prosper. Our second lesson today comes from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and lay bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into the heaven, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Here in Selective. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one 
who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in the present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields, along with persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life, but many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, this is an interesting text today. I hope you noticed in our other scriptures, too, there was a lot of emphasis on asking for God's mercy and grace and asking for God's blessing. But we're going to focus mostly on the gospel today because there are some interesting and very provocative questions that are in this, this particular text. And I want to remind us where we've been here recently. If I was going to t entitle this sermon, I would uh, entitle it The Return of of the provoking Jesus. Why would I say that? Is because recently we've seen Jesus speak very plainly with his guys. Remember, they've got down who he is. They just don't understand what he's about, what his ministry is all about. And he's told them plainly, very plainly, in prosaic language, I'm going to go, be arrested by the chief leaders, handed over to the Romans, be killed on the cross, die and rise in three days. And they are just in a world of hurt on that one. They can't, they can't figure it out. And he's told them at least two times, he'll tell them another time, and probably multiple times, and there are hints in a lot of the things he said. But Jesus has gone back to his kind of cryptic self here. Remember, Jesus spoke a lot in parables. And the explanation of those parables wasn't always available unless it was pursued by the disciples. And often they would come and they would ask him. But the disciples are so off track here. They're not really asking the proper questions. And so Jesus in our text today becomes a little bit more cryptic. There are at least two very provoking questions buried in our text today. And so, when we approach this, I want to ask the, the first question is, how does the young man, the rich young man, view Jesus, and what is the provoking question Jesus asks him? It's a very provoking question that requires a counterintuitive answer. Not one you would expect. That's what I mean by counterintuitive. What is that question? Question number one. Secondly, our second question is how does Jesus view this rich man? And what is the second provoking statement or question he speaks to him? There's a second one there. It's kind of buried, but if you look hard, you'll see it. So provoking question one, provoking question two, and lastly, how do the disciples respond later to what Jesus has said in his dialogue with the rich man? So those are our three questions. Let's look at the first one. How does the rich young ruler approach Jesus? Do you notice how he addresses Jesus? He says what? Good teacher. Rabbi told. That's the way you would say that. Good teacher. And it's a nice greeting. But what does it tell you? about the way he's approaching Jesus. He sees Jesus as a good teacher, perhaps the best teacher. Maybe he's followed Jesus' career. Maybe he's been in the background and seen him. He's certainly heard about Jesus. And he's thinking to himself, now this is a guy who's got something going on. Well, I hear miracles are happening. And his preaching is very interesting. Maybe he can help me answer the question. Because I really want to get into heaven. I want to get into the kingdom of God. I'm going to go ask him what he thinks I need to do in order to gain eternal life. So he sees Jesus as a good teacher. You know, many people see Jesus as a good teacher. In fact, a lot of people would rank him right in there with all the other religious teachers, Muhammad, 
Buddha, Krishna, I mean, the list goes on. It's a standard way a lot of people view Jesus. Oh yeah, a very good teacher, very moral. But you know, we're not really given that option by Jesus. C.S. Lewis has pointed out that you really only have three options with Jesus. Because Jesus didn't leave us any options other than these three. And Lewis pointed out, good teacher is not one of those options. So if you just think of Jesus as a good teacher, you're missing what he says. Because what he says about himself is incredible. He says he is the very son of God. He says things like, I've come down from heaven and I'm going to go back up there. He says things like, I am the resurrection and the life. This is way beyond simply a good teacher. In fact, those other good teachers I've mentioned in other religions never said those things about themselves. They would dare claim that. Lewis points out that Jesus' own statement about himself do not leave open the option of, well, he's just a good religious teacher. No. You're only left with three options. And one of them is that Jesus is a liar when he says that. In fact, on the level of the devil, he's trying to deceive people. And you know, we've seen people in our gospel take that tack. They have concluded Jesus is demonic. Some of the Pharisees and religious leaders are enemies of Jesus because they think he's a liar. And then Lewis goes on, he says, the other option you have is that he's a lunatic. He's nuts. He's on the level of the guy who says, I'm an orange or a poached egg. And we've seen people reject Jesus for that reason, too. One long ago, we saw a whole passel of his disciples go, this teaching is just way too weird. Can't accept it. See you, Jesus. Just, he's weird. I, I don't want to. Dr. Lewis then points out, the only other real option you have is if you conclude this truly is a good man, is that he is also the Son of God. He's either a lord, a liar, or a lunatic. It's called a trilemma. Not a dilemma, which is two choices, but a trilemma. Lewis points that out. And did you notice Jesus' provoking statement, his question, right off the bat to the young man is, why do you call me good? There's only one who's good, and that's God. And I like to think there was a pause here. Now, we can't tell from our text, because it just seems like he goes right on to the next thing. But can you imagine if he said it like this? Why do you call me good? There's only one who's good, and that's God. Pause, count five seconds. And you look at the young man, the ruler, the rich man, and he's got this blank maybe panicky look on his face. <laughs> and then Jesus goes on. It's a very provoking question. And the answer to it is counterintuitive. Because if I said something like that, you'd go, well, yeah. Grant, you know, we, we like that sermon you preached. You know, you're a really good guy. Wonderful, you brought that basket up here. Everybody likes to be complimented, right? But unless I miss my guess, all you folks who live here in the middle of the country, we get a little embarrassed, don't we, when people say, gee, you're such a good person. Don't you kind of look at the ground and kind of kick it a little bit and go, well, you know. Because we all really know that while good might be used in a human sense for us in a relative way, you're, you know, you're you got a lot of good things going for you. We're not really good in the sense that God defines goodness. Perfection. My wife's really good at this. When anybody compliments her, she just points to the, to the sky and says, it's the Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit. And it's really true. And so a lot of people interpret what Jesus' question is all about here 
that way. In fact, there are whole sects and groups of aberrant religion that say that. The Jehovah's Witnesses conclude that. Jesus is saying, well, I'm, I'm not really God. That's what they conclude. Because to look at it just up front, it appears that Jesus is saying, well, you know what? Don't call me good. There's only one that's good. No, that's not what he's saying. But some people conclude that. In fact, there are whole groups of religions that conclude that Jesus is not the Son of God, as he claimed. You see, this question, this provoking question, is really designed to jog the young man's thinking. Why do you call me good? Do you see real good here? What should I tell you? Whisper. parentheses, Son of God, right here. It's a very provoking question, and the answer is counterintuitive. Jesus is trying to get this rich ruler to see that he's something more than simply a good rabbi. But Jesus goes on. He says, you know, you know what you need. You know the rules. And he begins to list some of the Ten Commandments. He doesn't go through the whole list, but implied there is the entire moral law of God. He lists about four or five things. And it seems like a statement, but it's a really a question, isn't it? That's our second provoking question right there. You know what the rules are? Again, whispered, or in parentheses, how do you stack up? And the rich man takes the hit and he says, well, I'm good. Yeah, I've kept all those since I was young. You ever notice that phrase, I'm good? It's kind of a popular phrase that's in parlance today. You ask somebody, hey, do you need help here? Oh, no, I'm good. I'm good. That's essentially what this man says here. I'm good. I'm, I'm good with those. I've talked to people and I, I've asked them, don't you feel a need for God in your life? No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm fine. Again, this is a counterintuitive answer that Jesus is trying to provoke. Our second provoking question is how are you doing with God's moral law? And you know, on the surface, again, our intuition is to say, well, you know, I'm okay. I'm a basically a good person. I could say that about my life. I'm kind of one of those goody two shoes person. When I was when I was, I was in school, I was a teacher's pet. I always did what the teacher said. You know, one of those annoying kids who you look at and you go, "Why are they so?" That was me. So I could claim something like that of myself. And the, at first, when you read the law, it seems to say that. Moses says, those who keep these commandments will live by them. There is a promise that if you can keep the moral law of God, you will have eternal life. And it's a real promise. But the problem is none of us can keep it perfectly. And if we fail at one point, we fail in the whole thing. This rich man does not realize that, does he? He thinks, well, yeah, I'm basically good. I've kept all those. The counterintuitive answer to that question would have been, well, I try, but, you know, I'm, no, I'm, I'm not really perfect. That's not what he says. And notice what it says about Jesus and how he feels about this young man. It says, and only Mark tells us this. I think it's a beautiful little phrase. Mark tells us, he looked at him and he loved him. God loves even those who ultimately turn away from him. And here we have an example. 
to have what? He looked at him and he loved him and he said, Look. And I could hear Jesus thinking in his mind, You're really confused. Look, I'm going to offer you a deal. And what's the deal he offers? He said, Look, just Sell your stuff, give it away to the poor, come follow me. Come follow me. And most of you out there, I think, because you're believers, would look at that and you'd probably say, wow, what an offer. That man could have become the 13th apostle. Because it was the same offer. Jesus had offered to Peter and Andrew, James and John, the others, follow me. And of course they did. They got up right away and followed. Who wouldn't? Now that we know who Jesus is, give up everything to follow him. To walk with God. That's the definition of paradise. That's what Eden was all about. Before we fell. Walking with God. And what an adventure it would be. To understand and discover. The truths that the Messiah could teach us. But the scripture tells us at this point. The man's face fell. You can just see that shining innocent face. Of, or what he thought was an innocent face. All of a sudden, boom. Oh. He couldn't give up what he had for Jesus. Jesus tells parables about the pearl of great price that is so expensive and worthy that a man sold everything so he could have that one pearl because it was worth it. He also tells a story about treasure in the field. And when a man discovers it, says, I'm selling everything I have, I'm going to buy that field. Because that treasure is worth way more. Can you say that about Jesus? Our last question is, how do the disciples react? They're absolutely flabbergasted. And you notice Jesus doubles down. He goes, it's really hard for rich people to enter the kingdom of heaven. And we at this point should look at ourselves and say, Americans, we're one of the richest nations in history. And even the poor here are relatively rich to poor people in other countries. Wealth can shield us from understanding what Jesus is all about. Because you see, it's real easy if you come from wealth and you live in wealth to finesse the problems. You have the money to bridge the problems. Poor people often don't have that. And I suspect if any of you have ever been in that situation where you had to choose a lesser two evils, oh, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to cheat here. Otherwise, or God forbid, I'm gonna starve unless I steal some food. See, wealthy people never have to enter into that. And wealth can shield us from understanding who we are. And they can keep us also from seeing who God is. That's why there's a danger in it. Jesus says it's very, very difficult. The disciples are flabbergasted because they're completely the other way around. See, they're still thinking, well, the way you get to eternal life is by keeping God's laws. And one of those is to be generous. learned not to wave my hand so much. Scraped my mic right off. One of the things the disciples understand about the law is the way you get to heaven is by being generous. That's what the law proclaimed. The prophets all said that. Take care of the poor, the widows. It's a part of Jewish religion to be very generous. And to give alms and to help poor people and to help people in distress is what they call tzedakah. Righteousness, literally. It's the way you build righteousness. And the, the disciples are flabbergasted. Well, if rich people who have the means to do these, these, these works of righteousness, how can anybody get into heaven? And Jesus says it flatly. He says it's impossible for y'all. 
not possible for human beings to get it in heaven. But with God being God, all things are possible. It's not impossible with God. And friends, this is the truth of the gospel. It's hard to understand sometimes. That's why you can know who Jesus is, but not really understand the gospel. Maybe some of us have sat in church for years, and then it finally dawned on us what the gospel meant. It was that way with Luther. He tried everything he could. Works of righteousness, Seneca, giving alms, helping people, doing this, doing that, and never found satisfaction knowing that he was saved. Because you can't do those things perfectly. Oh, they're good things to do, please. We should be involved with that. But they don't earn us heaven. There's only one way, and that's by grace through faith. Believing in Jesus' righteous life. Who was the only one who perfectly kept the law and who gives us that life now? So that before God, we can say, we're plugged into Jesus' life. It's his righteousness we depend on. That's why Jesus says it's impossible. And then it's Peter's response. But Lord, we've given up everything. Peter, Peter, don't worry. There's no one who gives up everything that won't be compensated for that. Now and in the future, don't worry. Why? Because if you have Jesus, even though you lose everything, you have everything. He is the heir of the universe. And because of that, we inherit with him if we have his life in us. And that, my friends, is the gospel. You wonder if you're tracking with Jesus, can you say, in the words of the hymn, I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. You can have all the world. Just give me Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. If you can say that, you know you're on the track with God. Amen. Our scriptural song is in your blue hymnal. It's number 783, and we'll do verse, no, excuse me, is that right? 415. 415, yes, I'm on the wrong line. God of grace and God of glory in your green hymnal.
that you're gracious and you're glorious. We don't perhaps always understand your glory, but we understand that you love us so much that you gave yourself for us and invited us to come and request and make prayers to you, and so we do now. Father, we have people that we're concerned about. We heard this morning of the Hansons, Mylan and Luru. We lift their names up to you, Lord, and that whole family. When we think of Mary Jo, Paul, Donna, Kitty, June, Daryl, Pam, Ben, Derek, Kevin, Betty, Beth, Kim, Wendy, Greg, Tracy, Dennis, Gannon, Don, Gentina. Think of Tori and Harold. And folks at our rehab homes, think of Diane, Ruth, and Tom. Lord, in your mercy. And Father, we lift up names of those that are far away from us, either serving or away at school. We think of Matt, Braden, Greg, John, Clay, Landon, Justin, Taylor, John, Laura, and Kaya, and our missionaries, Anne and Willie. Lord, we ask that you be with these, though we can't be. Give them grace. Let them know your presence is there. Cause them to follow in your ways. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Father, too, we lift up to you so many other concerns that we have. Concerns of our nation, for a world that seems like it's on fire, for violence, for confusing situations, Lord. And Lord, maybe our own personal situations, troubles at home or with friends or in families where difficulties seem to abound. Lord, we lift these up to you now in silent prayer. Lord, in your mercy, thank you, Lord, that you do hear us and that you are with us at all times. We give you glory and honor and praise. And we ask for one more thing, that you give us the grace to receive the answers to these prayers. Lord, we know that you hear us and that you will answer. Help us to hear what those answers are and to gratefully receive them. We ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. At this time we'll take our offering.
And now let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, Receive now the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his face upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord shine the light of his presence upon you and give you peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And our final hymn is number 406. Take my life.